before we jump into today's video, um, I want to tell you about an organization that a friend of mine is volunteering with. Uh, he's in the Ukraine right now, where the crisis is currently ongoing. Uh, the group that he volunteers with is uh, called Stab Dobra. I hope I'm pronouncing that mostly correctly. Uh, I'm going to put all of their information, Facebook, Instagram, ways to donate down below. Uh, in short, um, the main focus of this is to help field medics and soldiers that work in the front lines uh, in the east and south of Ukraine. Uh, the team supplies medics with everything they need to save lives, medical drugs, equipment, diesel generators, communication devices. They repair cars. Sometimes they buy used cars uh, from Europe and make them work. Uh, they buy night vision devices. Uh, uh, they, uh, you know, some of that money goes towards uh, trips to the east of Ukraine to deliver humanitarian aid to civilians. Uh, many of you know, the, a lot of supply chains have been cut uh, since the war, and even they've done some evacuating of, of civilians from uh, dangerous areas if they agree to leave. Um, and one of the things with donating to one of these smaller organizations is that uh, it's more can be more effective than you know the the big uh, organizations such as red cross and whatnot i myself have you know worked for um charitable organizations i know how much money goes to overhead and uh, especially with these larger ones you know there's been scandals in the media recently so uh, i hope that you consider uh, if you're able to uh, contributing to this cause and uh, supporting uh, everyone in the ukraine Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the next uh, Math Talk episode. Uh, today, I'm really glad to be joined with Dr. Andre Bauer, uh, who's at the University of Lub Ljubljana. Did I say Ljubljana, that? yes. Hi. Hello. Yeah, so uh, I, I suppose you just want to give a, a brief introduction uh, to some of our guests who, who may not be familiar with uh, uh, some of the things that you currently are working on. Uh, yeah, so I have been involved with various things uh, surrounding type theory uh, in the recent years, uh, in particular homotopy type theory and uh, proof assistance. Um, I've uh, thought about how proof assistance work, how they should work, and so on. That's all related to type theory, and before that, homotopy type theory. Um, earlier, with my PhD, I studied uh, computability in topology and analysis and, and, and constructive mathematics and constructive mathematics is still something that I do. Excellent, excellent. So yeah, I normally like to, uh, after the brief introduction, I like to take things all the way back. And, and the first question I'd like to start with is, uh, how did you first come to mathematics? Like what did it take a while or did you just always have a knack for it at a young age? Were there any like, big influences in terms of people or events that that uh, led you to math in the first place? I, I was always interested in natural sciences. And then uh, when I was around 10, math really got me. And I, without a doubt, the most important influence is my dad, because he was also very good at math at sc in school. But uh, he wanted to be a math teacher, but he never had the chance to become one. Ah. So he always... He would always uh, tutor various uh, daughters and sons of uh, friends and my cousins and so on. And um, they would be sitting in our kitchen and I was just running around. And I think by osmosis, I was picking right. up math. Ah, that's great. And, that's great. Yeah. yeah. And then so uh, I guess by the time it came, uh, when it came time to go to university, you already decided you wanted to do mathematics. Um, and then what was sort of the, the process that led you towards um, constructive mathematics and, and thinking about like, uh, I think you mentioned like computable topological problems? Yes. So uh, actually, I... Uh, when I was in, in uh, when I was when I studied math in Ljubljana at the undergraduate level, I got really interested in topology, and my undergrad thesis was in geometric topology. Uh, but then um, a professor of mine, Marko Petkovic, who was a uh, who got his uh, PhD from Carnegie Mellon University, 
suggested that I apply there. And so I did. And I was very lucky to become a student of Dana Scott's. And uh, he was, he's a big name in, um, in uh, constructive math and, and uh, um, other topics. And uh, during my uh, PhD, when I studied uh, how to computability in topology and analysis, that is to say how to compute with uh, things like uh, points of a topological space rather than just discrete data, um, that turned out to be related to uh, constructive math. And that's how I got to know more about constructive math. Oh, interesting. Interesting. And then so that, uh, so so I, when uh, you first, uh, I guess when you graduated with your PhD, you had a little bit of experience with constructive mathematics. Um, but uh, I suppose, uh, when did the the notion of, uh, when did you get introduced to proof assistance and, and homotopy type theory? Okay, so yeah, so that was a bit later. It must have been around 2003 nine or ten uh there is a blog post on my blog i think it might actually be the first one where i uh posted something about um um formalizing some proofs uh in 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 cock uh, and uh, at some point i decided it was time to learn one of these tools and so mm. um it was an interesting experience, uh, but uh, that's that's when I did it. I, I I think I think I wanted to show some uh, proof extraction from proofs. That's why I needed it. Mm -hmm. um, how to how to extract a particular kind of functional program from a proof by induction, where you yeah. want to. I think I think it was you want to have memoization, which is a technique in uh, in, in in programming where you uh, sort of cache results that you've already computed. I wanted to have a proof of in, proof by induction that did that when you extracted the proof uh, the program from the proof. So, uh, so, so I I, you, I wanted you to learn. You were motivated by like a, a pretty hands on, pretty concrete problem. Uh, oh, I very I or... yeah. So in a way, in a way, some of the things that I study are abstract. But on the other hand, I, I, I at least I personally always see a very straight path to to something to something concrete in, in, in some sense. So either usually it's has, usually it has something to do with computer science, right? right. Computing with topological spaces uh, that has a very clear motivation. You want to have a program and you know, you stick in an element of some crazy space and you want to compute with it. You don't want to have to manually first figure out how you're going to represent it, right? You right. want to do it abstractly directly and so on. Right. Um, right. But but I've learned. I think I learned this lesson probably at CMU, where the entire um, uh, programming language group uh, was working at a certain level of abstraction. Which which I, I think I learned that it's it's valuable to mm. to think even about concrete things in 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 a certain abstract way, that, because that can have a, a lot of good uh, effects uh, later on. So, oh, one other thing I should mention I work on is uh, programming languages, of course, um, mm. uh, computational effects. Um, that's, that's, uh, I'm not so active in that now, but I'm definitely uh, it's an area that uh, I'm interested in also theory of programming languages. Oh, okay. Uh, I actually, uh, yeah, I wasn't, uh, I'm not as familiar with, with uh, some of your work in that area. Uh, could you say a little bit more about like, so what, what uh, typical research in, uh, different programming languages look like uh, l typically looks like. So, um, in programming language theory, what one I'm, I'm sure different people have different views of this, but my my, my understanding is that it's uh, it's it's the um, you bring mathematical tools to the table when you think about design of programming languages. What pro what a programming language should be? How should it be designed? What are what is its overall structure? And this. Uh, goes very well with uh, category theory, um, uh, domain theory. So that's uh, a more particular topic tailored to programming languages. So these are mathematical tools that allow you to sort of decompose the structure of a programming language into different kinds of concepts that have a clear mathematical meaning. And uh, that get, gives you ideas. Well, so first of all, it allows you to uh, analyze what's going on, but it also when you bring in a new mathematical idea, it can 
create or suggest a new concept. So a concept that is well known um, that I've worked on is uh, handlers. So computational algebraic operations and handlers with Mattia Pretnar, mm -hmm. a colleague of mine. Um, we uh, designed a programming language, the first programming language, uh, F it's called, uh, that has this new concept. It's a generalization of exception handlers. And mm -hmm. so uh, it came straight from algebra. So in Matthias PhD, uh, he studied with Gordon Plotkin in Edinburgh. Um, he introduced this concept um, and we said, okay, so, well, if it's such a nice mathematical concept, then how do you turn it into a, a tool for programmers? And so that, that has been one idea that I think was, uh, it was quite nice that we, we got it working. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So that's another case of abstraction leading to something concrete. Right, right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've started to come up uh, uh, some some of my friends who are a bit more on the computer science side of things have uh, started saying some interesting stuff to me about uh, category theory and the way that they're contextualizing like certain programs and operations in that sense. It's, it's got me pretty interested. Uh, to, to bring it back uh, slightly to the, the proof assistant. So uh, when you when you had that first project uh, where you were programming, it was in Coq, that first project? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so at that point, were you doing like homotopy type theory, like univalent foundations, or were you just no, using no, no. The, the, uni the basic? The univalent foundations were not there yet. It okay. was a couple, at least a couple of years before that, maybe more. Um, right, right. Um, uh, so this was just... Uh, um, I just wanted to use a tool that would allow me to show how uh, a constructive proof leads to an algorithm. Right. And Koch is very good at that. Um, uh, and so is Agda uh, and several others because they're based on constructive type theory. So you get the uh, propositions as types and proofs as programs uh, is very pronounced there. So you, 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 you really right. mix the two. Right. Right. Uh, so by the time you're done proving something by induction, you have also constructed at the same time some recursive function. Right. It's 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 the same thing. Right. Right. Yeah. I actually I don't have any experience with Agda, but I went to a, a summer school this year where I learned uh, some programming in Coq along with homotopy type theory. Oh, the online one. Uh, uh no, or, this was uh, in Cortona, uh, Italy, ah, okay. actually. Aha, yeah. aha, cool. Very yeah. cool. Yep. Yeah, that yep. was lovely conference. Lovely conference. Yeah. Um, and so so then um was the process of of coming to univalent foundations just uh, a function of that becoming more pr prevalent in the cock community? Or was that more because like were did you start thinking about homotopy theory more and, and did you sort of come at it from that angle? Actually, there is an interesting backstory that I don't think uh, many people know. Um, so when I was a postdoc at the Mitte Kleffler Institute in Stockholm, that was in uh, 2001, uh, Steve Audi was there also and a bunch of other people. But I work with Steve on um, an interpretation of type theory, uh, a category theoretic interpretation of type theory. So we wanted to relate... Um, uh, a certain kind of categories. Uh, so, so this is this is a common this is a common. Let let me let me put some context. Put this into a context here. So, quite often, what happens is you have two kinds of formalisms, like category theory and type theory, and you're interested in how they relate. And so then you find some feature of one of them, and you wonder what does it correspond to on, on the other side. And so this was the connection between category theory and and type theory at the time was, I mean, very well studied. Uh, people studied uh, type theories and vibrations. There were several ways to connect them. Anyhow, so there is a particular kind of category called a regular category, which is quite common. It has good features. Essentially, it allows you to take images of, of, of maps. Mm -hmm. um, and we were studying what's on the other side. What's, what's the type theoretic equivalent of it? Mm -hmm. And we uh, came up with this paper called Propositions as Bracket Types. Mm -hmm. The idea was that taking an image of a function or a morphism um, is, uh, so, so is like, um, uh, is like uh, 
squashing a type is it, you you take you take a type and you make all its its elements equal and we call that a bracket type mm -hmm. and we we show the basic result you, you know you know you, you know what kind of result you go for so just uh, showing that this correspondence is very good and so we did this but we at the time i mean i knew very little about type theory then we did it for a kind of type theory that's called extensional type theory mm. but everybody else so this was stockholm right this is this martin Luff lives in stockholm right this was mm. at the center of type theory right. and when we did that everybody was saying like yeah but why are you using extensional type theory that's like 1980 mm. and they don't do that right mm. you should use you should use martin Luff type theory and we said, okay, okay, uh, but we didn't know what to do, right? Because it was different. It didn't fit. Right? So we spent some time thinking about what to do about it. And out of that, later on, so uh, I focused on other things after that, like constructive math and computability uh, uh, um, and, and programming languages. But Steve continued to work on this. And I remember at some point, so we actually tried more on a visit. We, ne we never got anywhere. So, but the problem arose from us trying to do that, that kind of thing, but with a different kind of, 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 of type theory. Mm. And I visited Pittsburgh at some point, uh, Carnegie Mellon, and uh, um, Steve's student, Michael Warren, was there. And uh, I talked to him, and he and, and Steve like ask him, ask him about the uh, the thing we did about the type theory business, mm. and uh, he just gave me the, like, the, the I remember which room it was. He described the homotopy type theory interpretation of mm. type theory. He said, "Yeah, we got this right," and he described the basic features of it. Um, and uh, like the 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 Quillen model categories, everything was there. Um, so uh, that's so that so that's the backstory of of at least how Steve and Michael came to it. And Vladimir Voivodsky just sort of just showed up at some like I, I don't even know how like, he just appeared at some point and he started doing these things and he said, yeah, simplicial sets and I have a an interpretation of the. Uh, uh, of dependent type theory in simplicial sets and uh right, it's got right. these features and he was an outsider right so mm. he came in and he talked these weird ways and was not he was thinking in strange new ways uh, uh, but but you know it's it, i always say if he were a student he'd be just kicked out of the room right mm. but here was a fields medalist saying let's do these super strange things that people don't ever do because they think that that's not how you do type theory right um, right uh, uh, and people listened right luckily right yeah yeah it could have been just a big miscommunication because it's really difficult to talk across branches of mathematics right right certainly yeah yeah, and I think that's also part of the the delicate balance of um uh there's this this quote, I can't remember who it's by, but but uh they they say something uh to the effect of like in mathematics as in engineering, sometimes you have to cross a, a bridge without testing its uh structural stability. And I find there's this uh I don't know when you're collaborating with someone. If you're always uh, saying they're throwing out statements and you're always saying, well, how do you know? What's the proof of that? And I'm very much the kind of person to do that at every step, but I sort of have to stop myself and say, OK, let's just assume this is true and maybe it leads somewhere and we see that, OK, yes, because of these other reasons, we should go and try and prove. Right. This. I mean, yeah, definitely. Uh, um, keep in mind, mathematics is a human activity, right? So yeah. it's, it, 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 it inherits all the features of what humans, how humans work together. Um, it's, it's very much like that. Uh, uh, maybe the, the topic is maybe a bit peculiar, but the, the, the method is still very human. Certainly. Even Certainly. when you add proof assistance to it. I don't right. know what's going to happen when Google or somebody else walks in with a big neural network. That might be a bit different. Right. But right. We, shall, we shall see. <laughs> yeah it's uh definitely interesting to to see what will happen i i think some people have already started uh playing around with that uh, they haven't gotten you know too too far but uh as yeah pe people are already trying to make some moves towards it oh yeah i think there are several groups working on on using um, ai methods and machine learning in in proof assistance um I think we really need to try, keep trying, because the potential that this sort of thing has 
is enormous. So, uh, you know, AlphaZero changed, and even before that, Stockfish and the other programs, they changed chess, right? Yeah. So Deep Blue was the first one, the IBM machine that beat Kasparov in the 90s. Um, it transformed chess, but it transformed it for the better. Uh, mm. Chess is not, it has never been so popular as it is now with the, in the yeah. combination with the internet and everything. Yeah. So, um, so, so that is that, that kind of change. So if, if we do the same thing with mathematics and we can have computers, which can uh, easily uh, outrank the best professional mathematicians, that's not just going to be interesting. That is going to be more important than all industrial revolutions combined mm. because a single mathematical idea uh, can completely transform society. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm, it sounds very pompous, but I, if, if you look at history, there, there are lots of examples of that. Um, no, certainly, certainly. Uh, I mean, so, uh, so, uh, Einstein's so theory it, of relativity yeah. was, was two postulates, right? right? And, and to get, to get to equals MC squared is, like high, I think there's technically one step you have you have to use an infinite series, and the rest is like high school algebra manipulation, right? Okay, so maybe yeah. So we should be careful not to trivial to make it sound trivial, right? There is a whole sure. there's a whole there's a whole framework around it. Yes, and, yes. And the historical concept that allowed yes. Einstein to get there. Yes. But at the end, at the very end, the ideas themselves, um, if you you know. It doesn't matter how we arrived at them, but but what the what influence they they had, and people might say, oh, you know, but general relativity, who is that? That's just black holes and stuff that astronomers hmm. uh, do, right? Uh, um, well, but but in fact, so I, I brought but, this example, but, they, but right, but there are real uses, right? General relativity is used in the G, in in the in GPS. I actually brought this example yeah. up to my students today. Uh, uh, one of the the linear algebra classes I TA I. I always give them a little math fact at the beginning of class. So today, actually, I showed them the field equations and I said, oh, the linear algebra you've used like goes into this. And by the way, your GPS wouldn't work if it wasn't, uh, yep. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And even something ridiculous like prime numbers, which ever since like even the Greeks, ancient Greek, they they were very much interested in prime numbers and mathematicians always studied prime numbers. and what were they good? Like, they're not good for anything, right? Right. What, like, who cares about prime numbers? Why would right. you want to know about them? But the moment the RSA uh, algorithm got used on the internet to yeah. perform uh, online commerce, right? Within two years, all living mathematicians ever sort of, they were, their salaries, their, their salaries were compensated yeah. by the society, <laughs> right? When, when that happened, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so the impact can be can be really, really enormous. And so, if we can make a, a quantum leap in 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 the kind of mathematics that we do, uh, and I think we cannot do it without machines. Yeah. Um, then uh, that's going to be a, a big, big uh, game changer. Certainly, certainly, and the and the run on effect that that has on other fields as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like it bi it biology, it medicine, chemistry, like all of these other things. Are directly impacted by having these these better uh, tools of of proof assistance. Certainly, yeah. Uh, so one thing uh, I want to mention uh, uh, to my viewers might not know, and I'm going to put the link in the description. Uh, you have a wonderful article, uh, the five stages of accepting constructivism. Right. And yep. uh, I, I remember reading it years ago and I was uh, my my mind was blown. So so definitely uh, anyone watching, I highly recommend you you go check out that article. Uh, but to talk maybe a bit more about constructivism, uh, I guess, what are what are sort of your views on constructivism? Would you would you say you're a, maybe a staunch constructivist? Do you, you think more mathematicians should be embracing this idea? Uh, if so, or if if not, uh, why? So I have a blog post titled I am not a constructivist mm. in which I explain that uh, I really... So you see, if you say... Uh, so at least in, in, in the constructive mathematics waters, the 
the word constructivist carries a lot a certain connotation it means not only are you a constructive mathematician you're also uh, an adherent to the philosophy that brought constructive uh, mathematics about mm. so uh, originally constructive mathematics uh, arose uh, where in in the well that must have been 1930s and probably 20s even mm. um when uh, uh uh people were really seriously considering uh, foundations of mathematics and already had some good technical knowledge about what was going on and uh, uh at least originally constructive mathematics was uh, very tightly linked with brower's ideas and he had uh he had a like he was he was coming from a philosophical angle on how he viewed mathematics uh, like what is mathematics um but later on uh, constructive mathematics turned out to be uh, to, to be quite useful in several areas, you know, computer science, this, that, like uh, shift, uh, certain kinds of math. And so the newer generations of, of, of constructive mathematicians, which is more of a neutral term here, mm -hmm. um, people who do constructive mathematics, they're not, they're not tied, they're not subscribed necessarily to the philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of them because the way I'm, got to constructive mathematics was by studying how do we compute with topological spaces. And that naturally led me to, uh, well, first of all, uh, figuring out what are the models, uh, what, are, what, 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 what kind of a category do I need so that it supports both topological spaces and computability. That, that was the topic of my, uh, of my uh, PhD. And then it turn, as it turns out, that category naturally lends itself to constructive thinking and constructive mathematics. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it got in. So it, it, it's first, for, for, at least for, for, in my experience, I, I got to it because it was useful for what mm -hmm. I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And we know that it is useful in other cases. Uh, it is useful also in certain kinds of geometry where you are working with sheaves. And then the sheaves, again, support uh, constructive reasoning, uh, mm -hmm. but it's of a geometric kind there. It's not about computability. It's about uh, features of geometry. Mm -hmm. And so I think the modern view that uh, is, is not that constructive mathematics is something one should do uh, because one's personal belief of mathematics is such and such, but because it is just mathematics that is more general and therefore more applicable in certain mm. kinds of situations. Now, not mm. everybody is going to use categories of sheaves and do mm. funky stuff, you know, but if you are in an area where it can be useful, then um, then it's a tool. It's, it's a really useful mathematical tool. And as tools go, um, history is full of this, in history of mathematics, uh, when you have a new idea, a new tool, a new method, sometimes there is quite a bit of resistance um, mm. in, because people, you know, you need a, essentially you need a change of generation before it gets used uh, or it can be just an idea. So, so a famous one is non-Euclidean geometry, right? So mm. when, when the first models of non-Euclidean geometry were discovered, they were shelved because people knew that they would be ridiculed for it. And so, uh, and if you, even, even something like uh, imaginary numbers, complex numbers, I, it took a long time between somebody Even negative out, numbers. E, right, right. But yeah. so for instance, even I think it's, it's uh, Euler, right? It was. So I think even Euler is very apologetic about using the numbers in some mm. of his texts. It's like, mm. yeah, you know, but let's pretend, you know, it's, it's okay, let's pretend. They're imaginary, don't worry, you know. Mm. So uh, the name fits the numbers. I mean, the, history, the name imaginary number is there because of its history. So um, I think, so what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that this divide between constructive and non-constructive mm. is, is burdened, again, by human activity. People mm. think... People think that this is some sort of, that it's a mathematical question of which one you should be using. Mm. It has absolutely nothing to do with, mathematic, with mathematics. It's completely about history and humans mm. because it arose in a certain way and there was philosophy tied to it. And then Hilbert and Brouwer had their 
had their, had their discussions and so on. So now people think that these are two options. They're not two options. This is, there's just a spectrum of possible mathematics. And we mm. just happen to be focused on two kinds of mathematics, the, the ones that have the excluded middle and the ones that don't have the excluded middle. Now, there are, of course, mathematical reasons why we do that is because if you look at uh, logic, the uh, excluded middle and the axiom choi of, of choice are the two principles that uh, ruin the computational content of mathematics. Hmm. Although even that is not entirely true because there are very bright people who have given computational interpretations of classical mathematics. Um, hmm. so, so my view is that this is not a question of either or. It's just, is this the right kind of tool for you? Constructive right. math, constructive right. thinking. Um, it's a little bit special in the sense that it uh, it it sort of cuts very deep into how you think about mathematics. Mm. Normally, people are used to, uh, you know, if you say, okay, I'm going to. So suppose suppose you suppose a mathematician wants to learn a new tool, so a new branch, like says, oh, I would I could really use some methods from measure theory or whatever, right? They mm. go, they open a book on measure theory, they start reading. It's not easy. There are new concepts they have to learn, a new co new concepts, but the thing they don't have to learn is how to think, mm -hmm. right? They just think the same way right? and absorb new ideas. The ideas may be very complex and difficult to understand, but they don't have to modify their own way of thinking. But that's right. precisely what you need to do to unlearn excluded middle. Right. So that's why I think it's, it's on a psychological level is more difficult to accept. Mm -hmm. and, and so... Then all the human things kick in, you know, because you sense that it's difficult. You sense that you don't have the time or the, 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 the you don't have the energy to invest into this. Uh, and then you come up with reasons why you're not going to do it. And you say, well, you know, I'm 50 years old. I can just keep going the old way. Right. And that's how the generation change uh, comes about. Right, right. Well, I certainly hope, though, uh, I mean... It's 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 one thing for me to say this now, but it's uh, another thing to actually get there and act on this. I hope that that when I'm fifty, I'm open. I'm still open enough to new paradigm shifts. Uh, you know, I think I think that sort of keeps you keeps you active, keeps you young. But uh, uh, well, maybe maybe by then I'll be too tired of revolutionary new ideas, and I'll be happy to just stick with the same thing. Well, speaking from my own personal experience, I think it's the bit where you get tired that you have to worry about. It's nothing mm. else. It's mm. you sort of say like, "Oh, not again! I don't, I don't need this." Right. Right. <laughs> and you find something interesting, something, something, something in, uh, else in life that 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 you can do. Right. And you say, well, "We'll let the young people do it. They'll do it better anyway." Right. Right. Which they will, of course, but that doesn't mean you don't have to participate, right? Certainly. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you've you've mostly um, uh, bringing things back a bit to proof assistance. You've you've mostly uh, worked in Coq and and Agda. It sounds like. Uh, so yeah, initially I worked in Coq and the homotopy type theory library, the hot libraries, uh, uh, which we initiated at uh, the Institute for Advanced Study at the same time as the hot book. Uh, that one's also written in Coq. But at some point I started, so I, uh, Vladimir uh, Voivodsky was talking about how, what kind of type theory he wants to have. He called it HD homotopy type system. And was uh, and he, was, he, he was interested in saying like, oh, you know, what would it take to have a proof assistant that has this kind of type theory? And that's also how I got interested into thinking about, okay, so if we had that kind of type theory, how would we implement it? And uh, that's when I started to, to learn a little bit more about what it actually takes to implement type theory. Mm -hmm. Now, I should say I'm very firmly on the theoretical side of things, and I cannot match the uh, French and the, 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 the Swedish who implement Koch and, and, and Agda. I mean, those are uh, they're real hackers. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I dabbed in this a little bit, uh, also to bring in some ideas from programming language theory on how you could use, how you could design um, a proof assistant. You see, because in a way, a proof assistant is a programming language. 
it's mm. a, it's it's, it's mm. a formal it's a formal syntax that you use to convince the computer to do something so in this sense it's a programming language mm. it'll do whatever you instruct it to do so i felt like there could be ways of uh, using ideas from programming languages. And uh, I dabbed in that a little bit. Uh, I had uh, two students, uh, um, Philip Haselwarter and Anja Petkovic Kumel, mm. uh, who worked, uh, we worked for several years. We had this prototype proof assistant called Andromeda, where we were exploring all these ideas. It's a very prototypey thingy. It's like an experimental, it's, 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 a, it's a lab mouse with put things in, take them out. Right. So that's, right. that's, uh, so one consequence of that was that I wanted to know how other proof assistants work. So I think I'm, I would say I'm quite fluent in Coq and Agda and I can sort of get along with Lean and mm. I tried 12 and then there's some more special ones, 12 and uh, is another one which is more geared towards programming language theory. Oh. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, during Corona, I organized a session, uh, a series of uh, online seminars called Every Proof Assistant, where oh. I uh, invited people who have worked on various kinds of proof assistants to present their proof assistants. And it's we, we, we saw all kinds of things, you know. Um, we There was uh, a very interesting one was a visual proof assistant for higher categories where you use your mouse to draw diagrams and their ah. n-dimensional diagrams and stuff ah. like that. So... Yeah, yeah. So uh, there cool. are lots. There's lots. There's lots of stuff out there. People are explore. People are exploring these um, the ideas on how you could how you could make a proof assistant, and uh, that work attracted me. Yeah, that sounds that sounds very interesting. I really so love that the one, idea. That one is actually that one's called Homo. It's 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 a website called homotopy.io. Uh. Okay. Uh, yeah. By Jamie Vickery and co-workers. You know that it almost runs in, is, sorry, it, it, it runs in your so it runs in your browser. You just go there and you start ah. like drawing diagrams. Yeah. But so you can have you, to can know. You, can you repeat the? Uh, I think the... it's called. If I'm not mistaken, it's Homotopy. Let me check. Because I'll I'll definitely uh, also put that link .io. in the description. Homotopy.io. I thought it was, but apparently, oh yeah. Ah, perfect. For me. Yep. Okay. That's fantastic. just one of them. Yeah. If you if if you Google every proof assistant, you'll get the videos uh, for all the other stuff. The, a lot of them are quite specialized. So there are proof assistants that are specialized. Uh, they're tailored towards, for instance, proving meta theorems about formal systems. Mm. Um, uh, so that's one kind that is common in programming languages. By the way, the whole this whole idea of proof assistants. This came out of program more. It came out uh, from the community that does pr uh, programming language theory, mm. um, programming languages, and and formal methods. That is to say, using formal methods to prove correctness of software or protocols, and uh, uh, that's where proof assistance, I think, originated. Uh, of course, there were always mathematicians around. But the adoption, if you look at what community, which community first adopted these ideas and actually started using them, yeah. I think it's fair to say it was in programming languages. And mathematicians came in afterwards. Because you might find, find this surprising, but I firmly believe that mathematicians have a very low motivation for formally checking their proofs. I don't think they really mm. want or need to do that. It's not interesting. Mm. So... Uh, only once the computer tools uh, start to give them new, fresh ideas and not mm. just confirm what they already know, then they'll start to pay attention in earnest. So right now we have some early adopters and it's very good to see the mathematical community waking up to the idea of a proof assistant. Mm. Um, but it's still, it's, we, we are, we're past the Wright brothers uh, stage of airplanes we're right. somewhere around the stage where we know, we know a brave man can fly across the Atlantic. We're around that right. stage, I think. Right. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, we, it's a catch statement 22. If mathematicians are not interested in proof assistance, then nothing's going to happen and proof assistance won't be good enough. And until they're not good enough, they won't use them. So you need to break the cycle. And so how do you break the cycle? Well, you break the cycle by creating a, uh, a fashion. 
right? You, right. you need to make it popular. Right. And uh, Kevin Buzzard has been extremely good at this. Um, it's amazing. And I think he's doing a great job for the mathematical community so that the mathematical community notices and knows about these tools. Um, yeah, I uh, think I think Lean's really been taking off in that way. Yeah. Um, and like their the libraries that they're building are awesome. There's there's a lot of like actual like like mathematicians getting in there trying to formalize things. Uh, I, and I'm I'm hoping that it it branches out a bit more soon as well because so I've found you know I have discussions with people in online spaces about about proof assistance and I I try and promote the idea and a lot of people sort of raise a certain skepticism that somehow what's happening in Lean is only amenable to algebraic type things because everyone seems to congregate. Uh, it's a bunch of algebraicists, right? Well, of course, Kevin Buzzard, who does a bunch of algebra and algebraic geometry, well, of course, if he's the main champion, those are the people he's going to sort of warp in first. So I think the, the next big step, the, he's got a big group. I think the next big step is we need to pull in like more an analytic type people to start doing serious things too and say, no, look, this is for everybody. Yeah, yeah. so and uh, uh, there are groups who do that. So first of all, we should probably also mention that there are some uh, there are also some venerable other proof assistants like Isabel HOL. Ah, right. Uh, yeah. Right. And they have a considerable amount of analysis in there. Um, so if you poke around, you will find libraries of analysis. And people are working on that and are aware of, of, of the, the fact that that's uh, sort of the next uh, the next mound to conquer. Mm. Um, but you're, I think, yes. So you're just, you're completely right. You're observing, again, human activity. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, you, you, of course, they're all going to be algebraists. What did you think? That exactly. they're going to be number theorists uh, right. joining uh, uh, logicians and some, like, a heterogeneous right. group just wouldn't function, right? It has, yeah. If it's, it, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, it, it has to start somewhere, right? There's exactly. no a priori reason why you couldn't formalize uh, any kind of math you want, right? What will happen, though, is that when you try to formalize new kind of math mm. or just a new topic, that you, you will have to think seriously about how to do that. And it is mm. very likely that you will need to reorganize and remodify some of the uh, ideas on uh, the concepts and the ideas um, because you will discover that, for instance, there is some implicit knowledge in the way they do their branch of math, but they they're not aware of it. So by the way, this is a very common feature of formalization is it brings out to light the implicit knowledge that mathematicians have and communicate and mm. uh, pass on that is not written anywhere. And this is something I think that mathematicians have a hard time hearing because mm. you think, oh yeah, you know, folk knowledge implicit knowledge yeah, yeah yeah the tribes in the amazon they do that kind of thing but us we we write everything in papers and we have proofs and mm. these proofs are objective and mm. if we all disappear today and somebody came in later they would just read our papers and then all the math would be resurrected that is like complete nonsense mm. there is so much knowledge and 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 methods stored in between, you know, in the fiber of yeah. the community that yeah. is that is invisible to people who do it. Yeah. And this is something that uh, George Gontier, who uh, led a project, a uh, couple of very influential projects on formalization, the Four Color Project, mm. the Odd Order Theorem Project. So these mm. were very, the, the, these were the people who crossed the Atlantic, right? <laughs> George and yeah. his group. Yeah. And so uh, he, they, they emphasized this quite a bit they say okay you go you open the textbook you look at it and you discover that they're doing something they're not really they're i mean they're doing it they must be aware of the fact they're doing it but they're not putting it down they're just not mm -hmm. writing it down mm -hmm. and then you have to figure out how am i going to do this in a proof assistant because it's dumb as hell it's not going to learn anything you have to tell it everything yeah so that's yeah. Uh, that is actually quite valuable to mathematics uh, it's it's exposing a blind spot. It's exposing this huge. It's it's more like a blind area. Uh, oh, certainly. I mean, yeah. so even even in my own. Uh, so so I I'm doing uh, research in the local Langlands for my PhD, and I've found 
there are like fundamental documents that everyone cites and points to for all sorts of things. And in some of these documents, some of these documents are unpublished pieces of work. There's like admitted in the bed of the text, it says, oh, there's a gap here. This needs to get filled in. There's certain things that are like, you know, ill sort of posed or ill defined where it's like, okay, I get the idea of this, this, this definition of work, but like technically this functor you've defined doesn't actually go, doesn't take in as its co like domain objects in that category. It's like up to isomorphism or something, but it's somehow imprecise, you know? And I think even if, even if I hadn't had, had exposure to the idea of constructive mathematics and, and proof assistance and, and everything beforehand, I would be frustrated nonetheless. And I feel like I'm frustrated even more now that I have a little bit of exposure to this idea of formalization. And I'm like, Ah, you see, but it's, it's very dangerous. It's very seductive because even though you notice these things, mm. I think after a while you can learn to live with them. Mm. It feels a little bit uneasy, but you can keep going because everybody else is going, you know. And who right. are you to who are you to question the the, the 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 ones that came before you, right? So, and you need to get a PhD or whatever. You need yeah. to get a paper out. Yeah, you yeah. have a project. So, yeah. these sorts of influences are not to be underestimated. Mm. So, in a way, one one could think that proof assistance do is to keep us honest, mm. to keep us honest to ourselves. So that's, uh, I think that's also, uh, uh, that brings a certain kind of satisfaction. Uh, oh, I have seen people get addicted to proof assistance. So oh. not everything is good about them, right? Ah. And they just write 100,000 lines of proof assistant code instead of get on with their career or something. Right. Yep. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned it because having that in the back of my mind will maybe make myself more vigilant to falling into that trap because I, I feel like I'm certainly apt to. So uh, It's sad that uh, our community, the math community, doesn't really have a good way to uh, um, appraise the work that somebody put in in uh, formalizing a piece of math. Um, uh, people who are not familiar with it say, okay, yeah, you're just wasting your time. We already knew it was true. What's the point? Um, and then even people who think that it's important say, yeah, okay, but how are you going to convince a hiring committee? You don't have any papers. Mm -hmm. You just have a bunch of code. What's that mm -hmm. good for? And then, um, so we are still finding ways of, of incorporating this new aspect of mathematics which I think is, is it's not going away, by the way. I think yeah. it's 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 here to stay. It's it's probably going to transform. It will be transformed. It's uh, it, just like the cars, the the planes we the planes that fly around today are nothing like the planes in 1920. But uh, we wouldn't have the planes today if we didn't have the ones in 1920. Right. So um, it's hard to tell what will happen, but it's here to stay. I'm convinced it's not going away. It has never happened that computer science bulged, you know, invaded an area and then said, oh, no, and just went <laughs> away. That has never happened. It will never happen. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so one thing I do want to ask you, since uh, you mentioned earlier that, that you spent some time thinking about what may, like what goes into making a proof assistant, um, what do you think are some of the hurdles? So, so of course, like you mentioned, in order to have proof assistance widely adapted, like we need something that is, uh, well, one, I think very user friendly, right? Like if we're going to convince mathematicians in general to do this, it should be no harder for them to pick up than LaTeX, right? They should be able to just like on any system, download a file, print hello world right away and, and, and get to work. So um, what are some of the things that you think would go in? Like, do you think any of the proof assistants that exist now or could become like the dominant, could become like the proof assistant that becomes widely adopted? Or do you think there's going to be future generations and, and what might go into those proof assistants that, that might become like the LaTeX of, of the future? Okay, so to first... Uh, answer the last question you're asking about uh, uh, a market where you have several products competing right and which one is going to be the dominant one and the answer is probably not the best one 
Mm. Uh, you look at uh, car technology, operating systems, phones, uh, mobile phone technology. Is there a reason that one of them is dominant? Well, sometimes it's because it was the first one. Sometimes it was because the co the company that 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 produced it was knew how to how to get it to out you know everywhere, or maybe it even used the monopoly or something. So mm. these sorts of marketing forces will determine. But these are marketing forces in 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 the sphere of social interaction between mm. mathematicians. They will determine what is dominant. I don't think it will be. Of course, quality will be play uh, will play a role, but it's not at all given that the best product will win. It will be the product that is best positioned at a certain point. Um, right. So I think that's just something that is going to happen. Uh, the way the way to counter that is to simply have several proof assistants to have several tools. So I always say, it's not important that we make one good proof assistant. It's important that we learn how to make proof assistants, mm. right? It's important that we have car technology, not that we have a particular brand of a car. Right. Right. We, we care about having electric cars, not just electric cars with such and such name written right. on it. Right. And um, so that's important. Even, uh, and, and sim it goes similarly with formalization, by the way. It's not important that we make one ultimate formalization library of mathematics that contains all of mathematics. That's just, I mean, of course, we're going to have huge libraries, but right. it's, we're going to have more than one because I can't imagine, first of all, I can't imagine mathematicians agreeing on everything so that they'll just mm. have one. That's <laughs> impossible. But also, yeah. it's just not how things are going to work. So yeah. the important thing, what you want to do is you want to be in a position where, say, uh, a grad student investing one year of work can produce as much as, I don't know, Kevin Buzzard and everybody around him in a mm. year, right? You want the productivity to go up. Right. That's where we should go. So now, now we come back to the question of what kind, what, what is needed in proof assistance. So first of all, yes, software quality. Uh, if you compare the quality of software that you get from... Uh, the, the major software companies with huge markets, mm. that is completely different from the academic software that the proof assistants are right now. Right. But things are improving uh, and, and, and effort is being done to, to, to improve, but they are still academic software. Uh, to a certain degree, that's not so bad. It's acceptable for the most part because the users are in academia. Um, but yes, there is a huge... Uh, improvement margin there you can you can make it easier to install you can actually have good documentation you can have tutorials and so on um, just like the latex ecosystem right is is, mm. is is it's a mature it's a mature ecosystem and you see how it functions yeah we, we definitely want to go there then there is the other question is the architecture of a proof assistant what is it that makes a proof assistant usable mm. and here at least to my mind we come back to this fascinating uh, uh, observation to me, it's fascinating that that a lot of what mathematicians do, they cons they think it's not math, and they don't write it down, and it's implicit what they do, but it mm. must become explicit in a proof assistant. So I can give you examples of this. Mm. So a typical example. So at some level, it 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 looks like it's just silly things about notation, but I think it's deeper. Okay, so when the mathematician writes something down, it is almost always quite imprecise. Mm. So you write down something like x plus y, you didn't tell anybody what plus was, but mm. at the moment I said x plus y, <clears throat> you think it's commutative and associative, mm. don't you, right? Mm. Because I wrote plus, I didn't, I didn't have to communicate anything. So this is the kind of implicit context that is, uh, that is present at all times when you do mathematics. And right. it's not just because plus has had the same uh, meaning for hundreds of years. Uh, even, even within a single paper or within a single branch of mathematics, you will see that uh, there, is, there is a lot of implicit knowledge. And uh, a lot of this knowledge has to do with how do you understand the communication? So two mathematicians are communicating ideas. And if you are quite careful, in listening and looking at what they're saying and what they're writing down, you will discover that it is 
incredibly imprecise from mm. a formal point of view. It's it's really amazing that they can understand each other. They write these like bad diagrams that with the arrows they don't even they don't the arrows even don't they don't go anywhere and they still understand each other. But even when they make themselves more uh, more understood, like in a paper, when they write a paper and they try to be more precise, they're still very imprecise. So you can yeah. ask, well, what do what is there that makes the man, how, how do they understand this imprecise communication? Hmm. And the answer is, well, each one of them is running in their head some way of making sense of whatever is being communicated. Hmm. And then you can ask, is there a corresponding part in a proof assistant? Because typically a proof assistant has a lot of components, only one of it, only one minor easy component of a proof assistant is the part that actually checks the math. That mm -hmm. one is really easy in a way. Once you've figured out what the formal math is and you have the formal statement completely resolved with all the details put in, it's actually not that difficult to verify that it is correct. And that's usually what goes in the so-called kernel of a proof assistant, the trusted mm. core, the, the, the thing that absolutely has to be correct. It's the your last defense, right? Um, the, that one, that one, that one is okay. The f a much more interesting part is everything else that goes around. So first, there are things which are well understood, like syntax. How do I make, how do I allow mathematicians to use their funny syntax so they can write things like less, less than or equal and use UTF-8 mm -hmm. characters and so on. That's, that's a technicality in a way because that's parsing and syntax and that's 1960s or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are new things which I find fascinating. Type classes. Everybody knows about type classes. Hmm. What are type classes? Well, type classes are, in fact, little prolog programs that tell you how to figure out what the missing, what they, they tell you ways of guessing what the missing information is. Hmm. So when you say X plus Y, how does a proof assistant understand this? Uh, well, it says, okay, it's a plus. There is a type class that says, okay, things that have a plus are certain kinds of structures. Okay, so let's see if X, oh, X is of type, I don't know, X is a, a tuple of integers. Um, ah, do we have any structure that has a plus on tuple of integers? It's precisely how a human works. Hmm. You see a plus, you reconstruct in your mind without communicating what the structure might have been. And you have to know the context you're in a group theory conference well obviously it's an abelian group right right you are in a ring theory you're you're in a ring theory conference yeah it could be a module you know it's mm. maybe a little more ambiguous mm. but you have some general idea these are the kinds of things that are getting programmed into proof assistants mm. and taught to mathematicians when you go to a workshop on lean they're going to teach you what these things are what the type classes are and everybody or People, I think, experience this as learning the proof assistant. Uh, if you're a programming language theory, you see, oh, they're learning a concept in programming language theory called type classes. That's where it came from. It's, mm. it, it, it was invented. I think it was probably invented in Haskell or some related area. Haskell is the, the language that has type classes and uses them a lot. So... You say, ah, oh, oh, mathematicians, it's so nice. They're beginning to uh, use uh, advanced programming concepts. They just, just don't know it. But I think it's fair to say that this is the formalization of the implicit knowledge that we never formalized or noticed. Hmm. So it's math. As far as I'm concerned, it's just another kind of math. It's, it's, it's a completely new math. It's not, about, it's not about mathematical statements. It's not about mathematical proofs. It's about the mathematical method. Hmm. It's the mathematics of the mathematical method of the community of, the, or even more precisely of how you understand the communi the mathematical communication. And it's the mathematics of that, just like logic is the mathematics of mathematics, but just a hmm. certain part of how do you establish truth? How do you express uh, um, basic ideas? And I think we're learning with, through proof assistance, we're learning that there are these huge swaths of mathematics which are just there waiting to be formalized. Hmm. And what is maybe interesting is if, who formalized them? You say, like, who, who are these people who, are doing, who, who came up with these ideas? Programming language theorists. 
Mm. They came up with type classes, right? And then they had a hammer and they said, oh, look, boom, 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 right? Mathematicians need this. Right. Uh, let's, let's feed them the type classes. So we need to stop, reflect as mathematicians and say, okay, if programming language theorists can come up with this stuff, we can probably come up with something even better. And that's going to be the next generation of proof assistants. But they need to be even aware of the problem in order to solve it. Well, hopefully, hopefully uh, the the course of this discussion has uh, uh, will will bring awareness to some new viewers who uh, weren't exposed to these ideas before. Oh, I'm sure that there are a lot of people in the proof assistant community and uh, you know developers who 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 are familiar with these ideas and uh, they know precisely. What oh yeah, I, I I met the people who aren't part of that community. Ah yes, so ho yes, hopefully yes, yes. this video will reach some of them. And, right, uh, right. If you're yeah. a mathematician learning about type classes, this is not just some stuff that came from Haskell. This is mathematics you were never told about, but it's in your brain. You're already using it in everyday life when you do math. You precisely you do something that's quite close to type classes. By the way, why is it that, so this is something that must happen by necessity. Proof assistants are meant to be used by humans. Therefore, proof assistants will adapt to the way humans do mathematics. Hmm. But because they are programs and they're formal, this is going to modify, it'll, it'll, you, will have to, you will have to take whatever the humans are doing, right? Mostly uh, ugly, so these are uh, ugly bags of mostly water. That's, mm. that's, that's a famous author put it once. And they will have to make mathematical or at least formal sense of it. And so mm. that's going to bring something new because whenever you have a new idea that is pre-mathematical and you make it mathematical, something exciting happens mm. every single time. That actually reminds me uh, of one one comment I want to make uh, earlier because you brought up the uh, the point of chess and and AlphaGo and Stockfish. Uh, so one thing that's interesting there's a a chess YouTuber I follow Gotham Chess and he sometimes what's that? Who doesn't? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's he's got like millions of viewers, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I I love his videos where he dives into some of the AlphaGo games. And it's so interesting, right? Because it's a total like machine learning uh, algorithm pumping this out, but then to take this and to retroactively go back and retroactively come up with this sort of explanation after it's been played out. And and it makes me excited for how that will look uh, when we get to that point with mathematics and how uh, will the, you know, the A, the machine learning algorithms will give us these things and then now there'll be a new art of interpreting that back into a sensible context right so this will be a new milestone a machine defining a new important concept in mathematics certainly yeah i'm looking forward to it. that humans that humans can understand right? yes and after that will come all those other concepts humans cannot understand right <laughs> Right. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's starting to get a little bit late over on uh, my yep. end of 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 the world, but um, uh, for some reason I've grown into the habit of of uh, asking this potentially difficult question at the end of all of my interviews. Um, where, if anywhere, do you stand on the uh, Platonist, realist, fictionalist? divide in the philosophy of, of, of mathematics. So I know we talked a bit about before you said uh, for you, it's not philosophical about constructivism, not constructivism, but do you have a, a philosophy of mathematics? Is there anything you subscribe to? Um, so uh, there was a, there was, when I was a student, there was a stage where I was very, where, where it was very, uh, you know, I, I got drawn into philosophy a little bit. I then uh, read lots of Bertrand Russell, uh, got cured of that after a while. So I prefer to stay away from philosoph philosophy because mm -hmm. uh, it's too seductive to me. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, um, so in that blog post where I explained that I'm not a constructivist, I declare myself to be a relativist, which is 
the position that there just isn't a single preferred way of doing mathematics or understanding what mathematics is about or explaining its philosophical underpinnings. Mm -hmm. There will be many ways to approach mathematics. And um, I don't see a reason why one of them would be more valid than another. Uh, I think it is valuable to have the different views of math, math, what mathematics is about. I'm, I'm quite certain that some of the best mathematicians, their, their very important ideas were actually driven by their philosophical conviction and expectation of what must be the case or, or where they should be looking, right? So be, based on your philosophical conviction, you're going to say, okay, so if things really are this way, then I should be this sort of math. I should be going mm. for this kind of concepts looking for them in set, in set theory i think this is in, in logic this is even more pronounced because it's so much closer to philosophy mm. so um that's uh that would be so my answer is as you see it's is, is totally relativist it's mm. it's that I, I just i just find the plurality of mathematical thought and of the plurality of mathematical philosophy a good thing and I try to understand these positions, the different positions, but I have a hard time believing that one of them is objectively better than another. I think these are going to be subjective, essentially subjective positions, um, people's nature, upbringing, character will influence mm. what kind of mathematics um, they um, uh, what kind of what kind of philosophy of mathematics they find uh, uh, more um, uh, more convincing, right? right? So it's 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 a bit like it's a bit like uh, the political spectrum. So mm -hmm. why are some people are in one part of the political spectrum and others are in some other part of the political spectrum? I think the question does not have a simple answer, mm -hmm. and it's quite apparent that there are many many factors influencing the political outlook of a person and i think it's similar uh it's it's similar in math it's if, if once people start talking about what is your mathematical position mm -hmm. then uh like what is your position in the philosophy of math how do you understand mathematics are you Pla platonist and so on then uh, uh it's a complicated question with complicated answers although uh we often hear very simple answers. Oh, I'm a Platonist. You know? right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, or I, I think of all of these, the most, by by far, the most uh, honest answer is I don't care. Mm. And I have a I have a feeling that very often people, uh, people have a position because they must. It's like in I was told that in Italy, if you're not rooting for a football team, you're not a you're not a real person. You cannot hold conversations. Right. So even <laughs> if you don't care about football then you still should be, uh, you should have a team so that you can actually right. answer the question. Right, so it's, right, right. sometimes I think it's maybe a little bit like that. Um, I see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the division the between realist, platonist, for, formalist, these were, I mean, there's something to these divisions, but I think mm. also the spectrum can be a lot wider. Um, mm. and, uh, I, I don't, I just don't find it convincing somehow, so. Right. I, I uh, yeah. Right. No, I like that take. I like that take. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me in this conversation. Well, thank it you is, so much uh, for having it, me. It's been wonderful. Thank you.